All right, our topic this morning is God and government. We're going to be talking about this for the next several weeks. Uh, not till the election, but the next three weeks. It'll end, it'll end when Rick Scarborough, he'll be teaching on, on this as well. And why teach on this? Well, one of the reasons, I think there's a lot of confusion in the church when it comes to politics. Uh, God's role in government and the role he wants us to have in them in society. I don't believe the confusion comes because the word of God is unclear on these issues. I believe the uh, confusion comes from a lot of silence, a lot of silence from the pulpit, uh, a lot of people who twist it, and uh, and then also it could uh, just be lack of of digging in, even on on our part as as the body. And so we are going to talk about these things uh, this morning. Why does it matter? What is the purpose of of spending a Sunday morning on it. Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verse 9 says that which has been is what will be and that which is done will be done and there is nothing new under the sun uh, because history has a way of repeating itself and if, if we're silent as a society if we as the light bearers are silent then darkness will grow and we as the church are supposed to infla- uh, Um, impact every part of our society. We should impact the teaching of the schools. We should impact um, the government. We should impact the family unit. We should impact the uh, workplace. Every area of life we should have an impact in as the church because we should leave our children a better world than the one we inherited if possible. That should be something we see as a stewardship. Can I give my children something better than I, what I received? Because we're given an account of the things entrusted to us, including our country. What do we do uh, with, with the place that God has placed us? And because if we as the church do not strand, stand up for truth and against evil, then who do you think will? Right? So that's why we're going to talk about these things, because government has a large effect on lives, and we'll talk about that more, and we'll see that more as we get into it. So I want to address three things overall this morning. What does the Bible say about government? Should Christians be involved in politics? Should religion influence the state? And if so, what is the role of the church in government? This is going to be an overview of these things. It's not going to be able to obviously cover those in a massive amount of detail, but I want to give enough light onto these things for you to see what the Word of God says about them, to have a good general overview. We live in a country where we're blessed with a lot of freedom, a lot of opportunity, um, and I think it's important as followers of Christ that we steward those things well, that we use those opportunities well. So we're going to start out in Romans chapter 13. If you want to turn there, Romans chapter 13. Verse 1 says, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise for the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore you must be subject, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this you also pay taxes. For they are God's ministers, attending continually to this very thing. Render therefore to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Strong passage, isn't it? In chapter 12, Paul is exhorting the church to be self-governed. If you want to go back and read it yourself, I'll read one verse out of it that I think sums it up very well. Uh, Verse 9, 12, verse 9 says, Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. 
Before he gets into any of the government and how the church should act, he teaches that we as Christians should be self-governed. Uh, in other words, we as followers of Christ should not need the government to tell us not to lie, not to steal, or to deal fraudulently in business. We shouldn't need the government to tell us not to murder or become drunk or uh, given to drugs or debauchery. We shouldn't need the government as believers of Jesus Christ. We already know those things are wrong. We already agree those things are wrong. And even if there was no government, we should not participate in those things. If there was no sword, if there was no wrath, we already believe we should forsake those things. So the Christian first, before we get into this issue of governance, should be self-governed. Self-govern. We as Christians should be clothed in good works because we're following Christ. Not because we're afraid or because of the fear of government. We should be self-governed because we're followers of Christ. Because we abhor what is evil and because we cling to what is good. This is not a salvation issue. This is how we should live as believers. As the redeemed body of Christ, we should be distinctly different from the world. And so even if a society permits something that is evil, the church should refrain. It should not participate. It should not uh, agree with those things. So he starts out here now in verse 1, let every soul be subject to governing authorities. We should be good citizens. He goes on here, we should be paying our taxes. We should render to Caesar what is Caesar's. That's what Jesus said. We should follow the law uh, from, from traffic laws, uh, business laws, uh, marriage laws. We should honor court decisions that do not disagree with the word of God. We as the body of Christ, we should have respect for those things. We should have respect for police, respect for our military, respect for the courts. Respect for the presidency and governors. We, we as believers, we should understand uh, that those are good things. Or at least should be good things. Good when they are ran properly. Why should we have respect for these? Why should we be subject to these governing authorities? Which means we should submit to them. That's what he's talking about. We should submit to them. Why? Verse, uh, verse 1 says, For there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that are exist are appointed by God because the rulers in place, they're not just elected. They didn't just rise to power. They're appointed by God. God appoints them. Yes, he works through human people. He gets them to do what he wants, but he, uh, and we have free will and they're, um, within that, but God remains sovereign in the affairs of men. So when we look right now at our country, uh, with, with, uh, with our president, President Trump, God appointed him. Eight years ago, he appointed Obama. Eight years before that, he appointed Bush. God appointed these men at different times. That doesn't mean they did everything right. It doesn't mean they used the position they were given just right. But it does mean that they were appointed by God. And we should recognize that. When there's kings, when there's rulers, uh, God appoints them. And there is no authority that exist except for ones that are appointed by God. If we resist them, it says we bring judgment on ourselves. He goes on, for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise for the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath. On him who practices evil. Rulers are appointed as God's ministers. I don't think that's a term we think of when we think of politicians. <laughs> ministers. But it's used three times here. God's ministers. That's what these positions are supposed to be. A judge or a government official should be to, uh, for the protector of those who are wronged. If I steal from you, uh, it should be them that stands up and says, that's wrong, that I am punished, and they restore to you what I took. That's the position that they should have. They don't bear the sword in vain. They can uphold a righteous society. They should be giving justice. We know this throughout the Word of God. He's big on justice. They don't get to write the laws. They're supposed to still work within the things of the Word of God. 
there's a doctrinal term that's been created. It's called unlimited submission. What that means is there's some people who view this passage that says we should submit to the government based on what it says here unconditionally, regardless of what they say, regardless of the laws they put in place, regardless of what they tell us to do. The question is, does this passage or the Word of God as a whole teach that? And the clear answer is absolutely not. No, the Bible does not teach that. The passage teaches us how government should act and how we as the church should submit to it. Uh, But the laws of government or man do not and cannot override the word of God. Okay, he is the king of kings, the Lord of lords. He reigns supreme. So we should obey the law of our land so much as it does not contradict the word of God. So where it's reasonable, when it's, when it's um, things that are unrelated, maybe we don't like it. Maybe you don't like that the speed limit's 55. You know what? There's nothing in the Bible that says that you're supposed to go 65. <laughs> so you're supposed to obey. You're supposed to submit to the authority. If you're pulled over, you're supposed to submit to the authority, to the process. Willfully, you understand, yeah, I broke the law. I'm guilty. You're right. We should submit to those things. We should encourage the righteousness of of justice being upheld in our courts. When people commit crimes, they should be punished. We should agree with those things. And we should be excellent citizens. There shouldn't be a finer people than the people who follow Jesus Christ. But also, we're not called to submit to tyrants. We're not called to submit to ungodly rulers. We're not called to be silent when evil is being done. The Old Testament prophets prophets always warned those who were practicing sin to repent so they might be saved and escape the judgment. We're going to go through a few examples from governing authorities because you should not just take my example from it. And so I'm going to give you a couple modern day examples of things where the church should not submit. But we're also going to go back and we're going to look at some things uh, in the Bible where places that he didn't submit. Now this doctrine is really easy to teach because it's not a few places in the Bible that mentions it. There's at least hundreds of places you could go to teach these things. But if the church said, or if the government says to the church, you cannot assemble as the body of Christ, the word of God supersedes that command. Of course I picked that one because of what's going on in our country. Of course I did. But these pastors who are opposing, who are telling Governor Newsom or Governor Cuomo, we are going to meet. We're going to follow the word of God. He told us to gather and to not forsake the assembly. And so we're going to continue to do these things. We're going to continue to sing praise despite your specific orders not to. We're going to continue to do these things. Uh, They are not sinning. They're recognizing that these governors have overstepped the authority that God gave them. Okay? They're recognizing those things. And they could face legal challenges. You know, we need to understand that a little bit because this is a big part about government and how we should be involved. If we lived in California, or we lived in New York, or we lived in Virginia right now, if that's where we were, if we were congregated like this, we would probably be in the middle of a court battle as a church. We'd have legal fees. I and the board here would potentially be going to prison for several months for doing this. That's a big deal. That's something that's changing in our country right now, and it's changing because we have leaders that are opposing God. That, that, have, that believe they have more authority than what was given to them. There's more examples. If the government says you can't read the Bible, preach the gospel, or worship Jesus Christ, we can and should disobey those laws. These are some very simple ones. Very simple ones. But there's some we can look as far back as the early church. They were persecuted and put to death because they refused to offer incense to Caesar. They said, no, I'm not doing that. No, because I am only going to worship God. I will not worship a man, even if the government tells me to. When people like Corrie ten Boom and her family hid the Jews from the Nazis in Germany, when they were supposed to be turning them over, when they were supposed to, by law, be reporting them so that they could be murdered, they were right to not participate, to forsake the commands of the Nazi regime, and to hide the Jews. They were definitely right before God. And they had to fight against this evil. 
Remember before Romans 13, there was Romans 12, and he said, abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. We should first be self-governed, and we should be looking at these things. Uh, there's places around the world where several of the things we've mentioned uh, are illegal, things as simple as reading the Bible, preaching the gospel, or worshiping Jesus, Jesus Christ. Places like China, Iran, and North Korea, Christians are not allowed to openly proselytize. They're meaning they're not allowed to convert or preach the gospel. Uh, and they're right when they disobey the government. They are right because their governments have overstepped their bounds. And so because of these things, this is an important thing for us in America, we're blessed because we're given in a place where we have a voice. And this is an important part why we vote as the church. This is an important part why we elect godly leaders. Because if we don't elect godly leaders, other people will elect ungodly leaders. And that, that we have a responsibility in. In the book of Daniel, chapter 3, there's three men who are Jewish captives. God had given the land uh, of Israel into the, land, uh, into the hands of the king of Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar. And when he brings them there, he tells them to worship this God that he makes, this, this statue. And in uh, verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 12, it says, There are certain Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not paid due regard to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold image which you have set up. You know, they were supposed to come and worship before this image that the king erected. Now, these people, they were delivered in to the hands of Babylon because of their sin. The Jewish people, they were delivered to Babylon. And as we already talked about in Romans, Nebuchadnezzar, the king here of Babylon that came against Israel, that came against them and defeated them and took them into captivity, was a man that was appointed by God. Is he using his authority correctly when he builds this statue and commands people to worship it? Absolutely not. But it doesn't change that he's appointed by God. And if the passage in Romans isn't clear enough for you where God says he appoints authorities, Jeremiah makes it very clear that God appointed Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, in one uh, section I'll read to you is Jeremiah 25, verses 8 and 9. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, because you have not heard my words, behold, I will, uh, I will send and take all the families of the north, says the Lord. And Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land, against its inhabitants, and against these nations all around, and will utterly destroy them, and make them an astonishment, a hissing, and perpetual desolations. Did you notice that it was God who brought him? God gave him the land and the people to him. But even in this power, we also see that as he tried to exercise it in different ways, it was a limited power. He did not have unlimited power given to him. These three men, they refused to obey the king's command. I think you're familiar with the story, right? He orders them to be thrown in the furnace, but they do not burn. Obviously, we're seeing God's favor upon these men for standing up against this leader who has abused his power, who has taken it too far. It's hard, I think, at times for us to understand when God would appoint somebody like Nebuchadnezzar. You know, if you were living in Israel at the time and you got taken into captivity and your family was sold into slavery, I think it'd be a hard time to understand why God appointed that man. But he made it very clear to the Jewish people if they would have humbled themselves, if they would have turned from their evil ways and would have followed God, they never would have fallen captive to the king of, uh, of Babylon. Because it wasn't about the size of their army, and it wasn't about the size of Israel's army. It was the fact that God gave them to Nebuchadnezzar. That's why they fell. And if God would have told Nebuchadnezzar no, then he could not have taken them. And it's important that we, that we see both God's sovereignty and man's responsibility within that. It's important that we see both. Daniel himself, if you recall, was ordered by a government decree under the threat of death to not pray to anyone, including God, for 30 days. That's in Daniel chapter 6. <laughs> this law, of course, Daniel disobeyed. And not only did he disobey it, but he disobeyed it openly where he could be seen. He prayed, and he prayed publicly. 
I was thinking about this verse, you know, and, and I was just thinking, can't you just hear some of the preachers today saying, you know, it's only 30 days, guys, and you can still pray secretly. Just don't hold prayer meetings, because if you do, it is so unloving because you fathers, you mothers, or children will be turned over to death. And think about that reflection we'll have in the culture. It's better to comply and submit to the government. Can't you hear that? Can't you hear that? Did Daniel submit? No. He said, I'll take the lion's den. Throw me in. Throw me in, O king. Whether I go to meet my king today or whether he protects me, my allegiance is first to him. And always will be. And that's where we should be as believers. Because the word of God supersedes the words of men. No matter how powerful of men they are. Perhaps the clearest place uh, is Acts chapter 4. When the apostles are told not to preach in the name of Jesus anymore. Verse 18, chapter 4, verse 18, it says, So they called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. You know, I don't think the apostles were looking for a fight with the Sanhedrin. I don't think they were looking for problems with the political world. I don't think they wanted to be at odds with them. But they said, if you put a line in the sand and you're going to make me have to decide to obey you or obey God, the decision is easy. I will obey God. And they're very clear on that. We cannot but speak the things we have seen and heard. We cannot be silent. These leaders are supposed to be ministers of God, upholding righteousness. Romans 13, it's talking about what we should do, but it's also talking about what the government should do. And when the government operates within its limited power given to it by God, it's a great thing to have. It's way better. We don't want to live in a place of anarchy. It's great when there's justice. If somebody is murdered, it's great when you have a murder a justice system that deals with that person. When somebody is robbed, it's great if you have a justice system that deals with that thief. Those are good things. But when, cor when they become corrupt or evil or calling evil good, then they've overstepped their bounds. They now are no longer operating as a good minister of Jesus Christ. It's very similar to the pulpit. It's also a position appointed by God, and it's very beneficial if the pastor is faithful to God and his word. But when he abandons those things, it can actually become an agent of evil. And the government officials are the same. We as the body of Christ should prefer persecution if it must come at the hands of human courts than at the judgment seat of God, of Christ. We should be more fearful of giving an account to God than we should of men. The nations God raises up and brings down are based on his sovereignty and our response. They're based on both. He is looking at the nation. He's looking at the people. Each time Israel went into captivity, God handed them over to their enemies. That's why they went into captivity. God handed them over because of their wickedness. The same will be true for us if we go down a path of wickedness. But the same will also, I believe, be true for us if we're a nation that is following God. That no matter what forces then come against us, if God is for us, who can be against us? We can stand against any powers and any kings and any armies and any men if God is for us. We can read several examples of this from the book of Judges, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, 1st and 2nd Kings, the major and minor prophets. We get a lot of insight uh, on what should be going on from the government leaders and the people. And we actually find that in the, within these things, God has a lot to say about nations. Now, of course, the nation of Israel is a special people. They're a special people. So the promises to them are to them, right? They're not necessarily to the whole world. But 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, talking about the Jewish people, says, Now all these things happen to them as examples, 
and they were written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the age have come. We're supposed to be able to look back in the Old Testament and learn from their strengths and their weaknesses. And we're supposed to see, hey, when they went after other gods and they practiced evil things, God judged them and handed them over to the enemy, and they became slaves. And when they followed God, that God blessed them. That even people like Gideon, if he only had an army of 300 men, could turn to an army of 186,000 because the angel of the Lord was among them. We need to have our confidence right there. And we need to understand that the people that are in power affect God's view of the country. When there's a righteous king or when there's an ungodly king, from David to Jeroboam, we see a big change, big differences. And we also see even when you have a good king, their sin affects the nation. Remember King David when he took a census? God judged that nation. That's a man after God's own heart. He still judged the nation. That's an author of Scripture. Wasn't perfect in his rule. Remember his dealings with Bathsheba. Those affected the nation. Go back and read about what the the consequences were for that sin. It it did not just affect David. It didn't even just affect his family. It affected the entire nation because of the position that he was given by God. And that's why it's important today that we steward the privilege and responsibility of electing our leaders. That we elect leaders that fear God. We get a say in who's the head of our country. And we should look for men or, uh, that fear God. That's who we should be looking for. So we should be involved in politics. Let's turn over to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 is where we'll pick that up. Jesus talking here, he says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. R.A. Torrey said this about being salt. To be salt in this world means to give life, preserving influence, stability, and holiness to the world. And the response of the world to good salt is apt to be persecution and rejection. You know, salt is an interesting mineral. I was reading about it more, and from what I understand, salt doesn't really so much mix, lose its flavor unless it becomes mixed with other minerals. It's the other minerals that then diminish the saltiness Uh, that is in it. And this is a a clear picture for us as believers. We're supposed to be full of Christ. But when we have Christ and it's mixed with the world, it loses its saltiness. You know, uh, I imagine a lot of you like salt on your steak. But what if it was mixed half salt and half sand? Would you still like it? (laughs) Would you still put it on there? And he actually says, you know, uh, it's, uh, if it's lost its flavor, then it's good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Well, what would you do if your salt had dirt in it? Wouldn't you throw it out? What is its value anymore? And so the same is true with us. This is an important reason why, why we should be living godly lives. Not for our salvation's sake. Our salvation is accomplished by the blood of Jesus Christ. That is how we become saved. That is what makes us righteous. But then we should walk as followers of Jesus Christ. We should be distinctly different. We should add a seasoning to life in everywhere we go that makes it better, that preserves it, that influences it in every way, uh, making the area more holy. Part of this being salt, where do we get this salt from? This is where do we get the life from? It's, it's been, we need to be a part of Christ. That's where we get the saltiness from. We need to be connected to him, not mixed. How much salt do you need? I was thinking about this. You know, how much salt do you need? You know, you have a steak. You just put a little bit of salt. 
a little bit. I mean, it's so small, and after you sprinkle it on, you can't even see it. You can taste it, but you can't even see it there. When we look at a country, and we're talking about being salt and light, you guys remember Abraham when God was going to destroy Sodom? And Abraham asked God this question in, in Genesis 18. Would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? As he's going, God, God's coming to destroy this city. And, and Abraham goes, but God, what about, what about the righteous men there? And he begins to go through it with them. Well, Lord, what if there's 50 righteous? Okay, Lord, what if there's only 40? Say I go and I only find 40. All the way down, right? He gets all the way down to 10 men. Lord, what if I find just 10 men in Sodom? Would you say, I would spare the city over 10, over 10 men. If he could find just a little bit of salt, it would influence how God would treat that entire city. Think about that. What impact then could this church make on the city of Frisco, on the way God views it? What impact could this church, even small in size, make on this country and the way God views it? See, sometimes I think we can kind of put things off in the church court, but not put it on our court, realizing that we're the church. We're going, yeah, yeah, the church should do better in these things. But if we individually do better in these things, when he went to Sodom, he couldn't find 10. He couldn't find 10 that weren't mixed with the sand. Think about that. So how much salt do we need? Well, we don't need a massive majority. We need a faithful minority. Just a small group. Just a small people that are crying out to him, that are faithful to him, walking unspotted from the world. And what God can do with that small group is unexplainable in the affairs of men. And that's why it's important that we as the church are salt and light in all areas of life. We should be salt and light in the family realm, in the business realm, in the political realm. In any area God has given us influence We should be salt and light. As he goes on to talk about light, he says, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Where do we get this light? 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. This light that should be shining through the believer is God himself, the Holy Spirit of God, uh, being manifested through the church, being clearly seen. So they glorify the church. No, not the church. So they glorify your Father in heaven. It's not about us. It's not about drawing the attention to us. So they glorify your Father in heaven. That's what it does when we're the light. You know, he uses this silly uh, example in some ways. We call it silly because he goes, would you light a lamp and put it under a basket? No, of course not. Okay, well, what about if you take a Christian, you fill him with the light, and you surround him with darkness? What does that do to the light? If we have the Spirit of God inside us and we clothe ourselves in sin, what's that do? Blocks that light, doesn't it? Makes it invisible there to the world. We as believers should be living different lives. And this light should be visible. It should be visible again in every area of our lives. If the church would have been silent at the founding of our country during the Revolutionary War, I don't think we'd have this country. I don't think we'd have it at all. I'm thankful we have this country. If they were uninvolved, if they brought no salt to the creation of our government, I don't think we'd have the Constitution we have. I don't think we'd have the liberties to exercise our faith without persecution that we have. I believe that today our nation is under strong spiritual attack. The church, the family structure are under attack. And I believe people are fighting our society and trying to destroy it through the similar things of the, of the doctrine of Balaam, to ruin our country's morality and to remove the fear of God from our culture so that we'll lose his protection. You know, Balaam, he gave the counsel. There's kings come against Israel, and, and he keeps pronouncing judgment against this king. 
And we find that, uh, that he gives this counsel. You know, King, you should just send in the women to lead their hearts away from God. This is not just a general sense like moving among them. He's talking about draw them into Baal worship, draw them into sexual morality, draw them away from God, and then you can have them. But if, if, they're, if, if God is with them, King, you can't touch them. But if you draw their hearts away from God, oh, they're just ordinary men. Just like Samson. When he's full of the Spirit of God, they couldn't touch him. Oh, but when the Spirit left, look what happened. How did the devil get to him? Compromise. Let's put a little sand in that salt. We need to recognize and understand as the body of Christ that we're under attack in this way. That the devil is trying to get us to compromise so that we lose our saltiness. He is trying to get us to be afraid. And in a lot of ways, it's very unfortunate that we can see within a lot of ways it's working. A lot of the church is afraid to even talk on any of these topics anymore. It's heartbreaking for me to hear that. And there are so many thousands of churches that still will. So thank you, Jesus, for that. But it's heartbreaking to understand that there is a majority of pastors that will not. We need to speak on these things because the Word of God speaks on these things. I don't get to pick what's in the Bible. My job is to pass it on, right? I'm told to feed the flock. What do I feed them with? With what I'm given to feed them. With what the Word of God says. And we as a body of Christ, we need to look at these things and we know, you know what, Lord, we need to be uncompromised. And we need to reflect on our own hearts and go, Lord, any areas that I've lost saltiness, I need to repent. That's what he called the nation of Israel to do. Even through the book of Jeremiah, he was calling them with Nebuchadnezzar. He said, hey, look, I've already raised him up. He's going to come. But if you guys repent, you don't have to go through this. You don't have to go through this. God is amazingly merciful. He's a terrifying enemy. He will give over to judgment, but he is amazingly merciful. And so we as the body of Christ, we should be influencing our society and pushing it towards godliness. One of the ways we get to do this, again, is, is through electing leaders. That's one way we get to do this. That's one way we get to be salt and light. If there's no good men to vote for, then we as the church should make it an aim to raise up godly men and have them run for it. So that we have an option to have a God-fearing leader. These are things that we should say. We should be salt and light in these things. We should not be separate. You know, the idea of separation of church and state. We hear that term all the time. It's an idea, the, the purpose of that is to keep the state out of the church, not the church out of the state. But we also don't want our government ran by the church. We're not trying to do that. We should be ran by Christian people. But we're not gonna, uh, we don't want to become uh, uh, something like uh, Rome when it became uh, controlled by uh, Constantine or something like that. We're not looking for something like that. But we're looking for a godly society, a godly society. One that does value and submit to and understand that there is a king in heaven. And we will all give an account to him. We should be praying for our leaders and elections. We should be doing that as the church. For clarifying on my previous statement just now about the church, the church absolutely should be involved in government. When I'm saying that we don't want the church running it, I mean an institution. We do want the church as a people running the country. <laughs> We don't want it to come down to an institution of the church, a, a specific branch of the church that is now exercising that power. That is what I meant by that. But we should do this, and our hope is not in the system. We need to understand that, too. Our hope needs to be in Jesus Christ. And my hope, if for a comparison, my hope for my kids to grow up and go to heaven is not because I uh, read them the Bible at night. That's not why I think they're going to go to heaven. They're going to go to heaven if they place their faith in Jesus Christ. I read them the Bible at night, and I talk with them about it, and I leave them that way because I want to give them the best possibility of getting there. So even though I recognize this is something they need to do with God, I also recognize I have a position of influence, and I need to use it to push them to Christ. And I need to pray that they go that way. And that's the same thing we should do with our country. We recognize, God, you appoint leaders. But he looks upon us when he appoints the leaders. Who are my people? Who are there? 
So the same thing as we do with our kids where, where we know that their salvation is ultimately a thing where they need to place their faith in God. But we train them up well. Well, we also need to recognize with government, ultimately God will appoint the leader, but we should do everything we can to, to push it towards godliness. Whenever we have the opportunity to support good candidates, we should. And when we can encourage others to vote, we should. We should be salt and light. But in the outcome, trusting God. You know, if the church in the United States all voted, we could elect who we wanted. <laughs> um, but we don't. We don't all vote. We don't all exercise that right. And so I want to encourage you guys to use that. If we end up with an ungodly leader, what should be said about our apathy? What should be said about it then? So looking back from when we uh, started this, this morning to the three questions, what does the Bible say about government? The Bible says government leaders are appointed by God for our benefit and are ministers of God if they are operating in their role. They have limited authority. We should submit to the authority of the state as long as it does not force us into disobedience towards God. Number two, Christians should be involved in politics. Uh, should Christians be involved in politics? Yes, the church should influence the state. God has a lot to say about the role of government, and Christians should be active in it. Number three, if so, what is the role of the church in government? Well, we should be salt and light in all the different areas, calling for righteousness, godly values, and godliness, opposing evil, and putting forth good candidates. We should be involved in all those different things. It doesn't mean that becomes our primary role, but neither does it become one that we neglect. Right? That's not our primary purpose. It's not a political purpose. But we understand politics affects all the different parts of life, so nor do we want to be silent on it. I encourage each of you to participate. Again, if you're not registered to vote, you can see Corey and uh, Noah here. They'll be out at the booth, and you can register to vote in Collin. Next week, you can also be registered to vote in Denton. Uh, the deadline is October 5th. If you don't register to vote by October 5th, uh, then you won't be able to vote in the November election. And so I hope you'll go ahead and do that. If you have questions about it, Noah is our registrar, and so he should be able to answer any questions. If he doesn't know them, we'll help figure it out for you. If you live out of Collin or Denton County, we'd be happy still to tell you how you can get registered so you can vote. We will be talking about this over the next two more weeks uh, and giving more insight as to our current um, political parties, our current uh, belief structures of different people running and everything, because I want you to be well-educated so that you can be salt and light. And I believe God wants you to be well-educated, so we're going to talk about these things for a few weeks. Again, our hope is not in men, it is in God. Just like my salvation is not in good works, it's in Jesus Christ. But now that I'm saved, I want to be careful to maintain good works. And so also, we should trust in God, but we should still be involved in praying for godly leaders and the law. Amen? Amen? Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, I pray, Father, that you'd help us as this body here to be salt and light. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be bold proclaimers of truth, to stand against evil, Lord. Lord, we know that the enemy, he's waging war against us. He wants to infiltrate your church, Lord, to remove the saltiness. Lord, to wrap the light in darkness where it's not visible anymore. Lord, help us resist those things, Lord, within our own hearts, within our own homes, and within this church here. But, Lord, we also pray for that strength, Lord, for the church throughout this country. Lord, I pray that you would raise up godly leaders. Lord, I pray, Father, that you would lay strong convictions on the people, Lord, that you appoint, that they would not be given to bribes, to injustice, that they would not be... Uh, followers of demons. Lord, we pray against the abortion in this land. Lord, I pray, Father, that you would end that evil. Lord, that you would uh, use this current administration. Lord, uh, this, this Lady Amy, Father, that is being appointed to the Supreme Court. Lord, give her the strength and the rest of the judges, Father, to fear you more than they fear men and to end this evil in our land, Lord, to end the sacrifice of children. Lord, we pray for godliness. We pray, Father, for Trump, and I pray, Lord, that he'd be in full submission to you. 
Lord, I lift up Governor Abbott, and we pray for him to be in complete submission to you, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, that he has not risen up against the churches like some of these other governors. Lord, I pray that you would correct or remove uh, governors like Newsom and Cuomo, Father, who are opposing your church, who are overstepping their bounds. Lord, I pray for your protection for those churches there in your favor, Lord, that they would be so salty right now. Lord, that that light would be burning bright, Father, and leading souls to you, we ask, Lord. Lord, strengthen us in you. Grow us in our love for you, Father. Thank you for your word that guides us in all these different areas of life, Lord. And help us to be faithful followers of you, Lord, in each area of life. In Jesus' name, amen.